One of the fields that my group at Harvard has pioneered is the field of femtosecond laser micromachining of transparent materials. First of all, let me briefly review what a femtosecond laser pulse is. A femtosecond laser pulse is a ultra short laser pulse, one that lasts just a millionth of a billionth of a second. And when you make laser pulses that short, they become extremely intense. Such a high intensity that the interaction between light and matter changes completely from the standard interaction that we're all used to. And that opens the door to many interesting phenomena. For example, imagine taking a block of some transparent material, say glass. Normally, if you take light and you focus it into that glass, nothing happens. It goes through. That's the definition of being transparent. Transparent means it doesn't interact with light. The light goes through it. That is no longer true when you have a femtosecond laser pulse. If you take a femtosecond laser pulse and you focus it inside the bulk of a transparent piece of material, the intensity at the focus becomes so high that you essentially rip the atoms apart and create a plasma, a spark, a state of matter where the electrons and the ions are separated from each other. And what we discovered in the late 90s by focusing one of these short laser pulses in a transparent piece of material, in glass actually, is that we could create a spark inside the material and create a little micro explosion, a little void, leaving a little void behind, tiny little void. I'm talking here about less than a micron or less than one hundredth the diameter of a human hair, maybe a hundred nanometers even, so a thousandth the diameter of a human hair inside uh, glass. There's no way you can do that with ordinary light, as I said before, because you focus ordinary light, it just goes through. So we use this technique for a number of different applications. One of them is data storage. In an ordinary CD, there is a set of pits, if you want, at the surface that is read by a little laser. You store one layer of data. In some DVDs, there are a couple of layers that are stored. This technique permits the storage of hundreds of layers because you can write them now, not just at the surface, but inside the glass. And you could imagine putting your entire collection of CDs onto a single platter. So for high density data storage, it's an absolutely unique uh, technique. Another application is microfluidics, is the making of little channels for a fluid to flow inside a soft material, in a transparent material like a polymer or a glass or, or any other hard material. For a long while, we studied the um, physics of this interaction. How hot does the plasma get inside the glass? Uh, what is it that forces the atoms out of the focal volume into the surrounding material? Uh, what is the time duration of these uh, different effects? And in parallel to that, we explored a number of different applications of which I've already mentioned uh, two. Now, one thing that we noticed very early on is that in order to create these little voids, in order to create these little you know, empty spaces, voxels if you want, inside a solid material, we needed laser pulses of relatively high energy. And you may think, what is relatively high energy? Are we talking about many joules? No, when you talk in really short time durations, even relative, what we would ordinarily consider really small amounts of energy create a huge intensity because intensity is basically energy divided by the time during which that energy gets delivered. If you deliver a microjoule in say 100 femtosecond, you have a power that is comparable to all the power that you know, is needed in a, in a city the size of uh, New York or, or Moscow. It's tremendous. Of course, you, you give it only for 
a few hundred femtoseconds, but it's an incredible intensity at a modest energy. Still, to compress a microsecond into 100 femtosecond takes quite a bit of equipment. So the lasers that were needed to do this tended to be amplified lasers and oscillated and all kinds of tricks to get more energy into the laser pulse and then ultimately deliver it to the sample. After doing this research for a number of years, we realized that we could try something different and that actually opened up the um, application into a whole different domain. What happens when you generate femtosecond laser pulse is that it's not a single pulse. It's a single pulse that repeats at a certain rate. Uh, laser itself generates the laser pulses at a really high rate, but with very, very low energy. In order to amplify, what you, take is, what you do is you take a few of these laser pulses, maybe every one thousandth of a second you take one instead of every millions, and you take that one pulse and you amplify it to high energy. It's impossible to do both a high repetition rate and a high energy because you, you literally need a couple of nuclear power plants in order to get the, the energy for that. If you just want to use ordinary household current, you can only take a few pulses every, uh, you know, let's say every milliseconds, every thousands of a second. So those were the pulses we used initially, those very intense but widely separated in time, a millisecond, um, to do the writing in glasses. But then we realized if we take now the train of pulses that repeats every fraction of a millionth of a second, even though they have much less energy, the energy accumulates. One pulse hits the material, and before the energy has dissipated out of the focal volume, the next pulse comes adding energy, and the next one, and the next one, and the next one. So basically, if you take low energy pulses, lower by about a factor of you know a million in, in energy, but that are very closely spaced, you can accumulate the energy. And we found that if we took this much simpler laser, simply a, a, an, an oscillator that generated a train repeating at, let's say, 60 or, or 80 megahertz, that we could accumulate sufficient energy to melt the material at the focal point. So now, rather than creating you know, a little explosion inside the glass and leaving a, um, a void, we basically focus that much lower energy but higher repetition rate train of pulses inside the glass. And at the focus, we're slowly heating the focus, melting the glass until we stop the laser and then it resolidifies. It melts and then resolidifies. But glass does something interesting when it melts. When it melts and resolidifies, it undergoes a phase transition. So it never completely resolidifies in the same density and phase than it did before. So we can still write structures. They're not empty, but they're a different phase of the glass. But here's the really cool thing. The really cool thing is that we can move the focus around in the glass. We can take this focus and either move the focus by using mirrors that we can move, or we can move the glass through the focus. And as we do that, we melt the glass and resolidify it. In a sense, we can write structures inside the glass in any three-dimensional shape you can think of. And it turns out that these lines or curves or whatever it is that you write in glass guide light. They act like a fiber inside the glass. So in a sense, we have a mechanism here to guide the light from point A to point B in a glass, and we can develop different types of structures like beam splitters, uh, demultiplexers for the telecom uh, industry, ring resonators, and so on. Once we showed that, a large number of groups jumped on the bandwagon, and now if you go to a conference, there are whole sessions devoted to femtosecond laser uh, machining. As I said, when you go to this high repetition rate, um, micromachining, the energy in the pulse gets much less. In fact, it goes from a microjoule to a nanojoule. 
A nanojoule is hardly anything. This means you can alter materials with very little energy, but you will not create any damage around it because as the energy dissipates out of the focal volume, it's nothing. Which means you can actually manipulate materials with incredibly high precision. And one of the other things that my group showed was that you can actually do subcellular surgery. You can take a living cell and micromanipulate the organelles inside the cell or the membrane of the cell without killing the cell. Other things you can do are nanoneurosurgery where you kill or cut, I should say, connections between individual neurons in little animals. One very attractive application is data storage. If you can actually get really high density data storage in a medium that is as stable as glass, it would be much better than just about any other current data storage uh, mechanism. Hard disks, we know they fail. Uh, flash memory, you name it. There's basically no way of storing information with the same security that, say, paper offers even though paper, of course, can catch fire and burn and so on. You know, if you have a book and you put it in a safe place, you can be pretty sure that a couple of hundred years later, you'll still find that same information. That is not true with magnetic disks, flash memory, and other data storage, digital data storage mechanism. So the femtosecond micromachining approach to data storage is very attractive. However, at this point, it's not practical. Because basically you write one bit every millisecond. And if you were to put all the data you could in a single platter the size of a CD, with the current technology, it would take an amazing 32 years to write it. So while extremely interesting, the technology is not yet, de yet there to generate the pulses at high enough rates that you can write this in a practical manner. So a lot of energy is going into finding ways to get the rate at which data can be written up to a high enough level. And that's a, a very significant barrier. <laughs>